Lex Thomas, welcome to Community Focus. In this program, I interview officials from both Sterling and Lancaster on issues that are important to our communities and on issues that we want community residents to know about. So today for both segments, I am delighted to be speaking with the town planners in both towns. I'm gonna to start with Dominika Tatashiori. She is the new town planner for the town of Sterling. Welcome, Dominika. Thank you, Lass. So nice to see you. You too. And of course, you are the first town planner in Sterling. So first of all, let's talk about what a town planner does. Just tell me kind of how you're, you know, sum it up in two sentences. How does your day roll out? Well, first of all, let me just preface. I know the title of a, sound, a town planner sounds very kind of broad and open-ended, but it's actually, um, I am a trained land use professional and I'm here to provide my expertise to the municipality in order to help them have orderly growth and development, the physical layout and shape of the community. Um, I'm also here to work with the different boards, uh, specifically the administrative head, which is board selectmen, and any um, you know things they want me to research, things of that nature. In addition to planning board, master plan committee, uh, economic development committee, and any other board or commission that does need my land use um, services. And I work very closely with the public as well. Residents that need questions uh, answered regarding land use and development questions, happy to always work with their attorneys and engineers in order to answer their questions properly so they can um, make uh, sound land use uh, decisions with the property before filing. Now, as not only a new town planner, but as the first town planner, and I know most towns do have a town planner on staff, so you must be doing a lot of reaching back into uh, you know, past documentation and, and that sort of thing as well. Is there a lot that goes on that way? How much do you have to deal with historically and what are the kind of documents and departments that you're working with? That's a great question. Um, I, I, from what I've noticed, there's no central repository for these documents. Um, so basically, I'm at the mercy of what people, uh, other boards and commissions and administrative give me in terms of documents. For example, like the 1962 master plan, I have that in my possession, as well as um, a Route 20 zoning um, corridor study from 2016, and in addition to a 2006 um, a water master plan. Um, I, I'm always looking for other documents. DPW has been gracious to also help me with information, uh, but I also have to rely on the Massachusetts Regional Planning Commission to see if they have studies that could, you know, that could be of assistance to me. And not only, not only for me, but also that we can use for the master plan moving forward. Now, you referenced the master plan from 1962, I think you said. Now, That's this right. was quite a while ago. And um, seems to me that what I've uh, heard and read is that, of course, most towns have uh, a master plan, which apparently we do have, but that, that it tends to be renewed every 10 to 15 That's years. Right. So um, how, how does this happen? How come Sterling's is so old? And what are the implications of that? And what makes it really important to have this thing updated? So in 1962, I, I'm actually, well, I would be very curious to know really what started that, the impetus of the 1962 master plan. And, and I unfortunately don't have that information. I can probably see why perhaps smaller towns like Sterling perhaps don't have a master plan. Uh, they usually don't have a professional planning staff on hand to assist with this. It could be a very onerous and cumbersome process there's a substantial amount of information to research and gather and write. Um, so I can see it being daunting almost for most smaller municipalities to undertake. Um, doing an actual custom master plan whereby, you know, a, a bid is awarded to, for example, a consulting company, planning consultant. I was quoted something in the ballpark like a town of Sterling of approximately 8,000 people. It's like close to $150,000 mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. and, and that's a process if you have one that's custom like that. It takes probably about a year and a half maximum to really get you know from start to finish the documents. Um, but so everything is going to be predominantly done kind of in-house and in, with the assistance of any kind of grants that I'm able to secure. So I'm always actively researching grants, writing for grants, things of that nature to help move it forward. Now, what is the process for setting up a master plan and where are we in the process at this point? 
Um, the community of Sterling received money from the community um, compact agreement that it um, engaged in to hire a consultant, Judy Barrett of Barrett Consulting, who is a renowned planning consultant from New England, very well respected. And I actually had the opportunity of working with her approximately 20 years ago when I was in Shrewsbury. Um, doing a master plan involves um, extensive community outreach and public participation. Um, so Judy is tasked with actually um, setting up the meetings in terms of engaging the, the, the residents of Sterling. So we've been having um, specific meetings every month to um, go over specific elements or chapter topics set out by the state statute for the master plan. You know, and they include things like land use, housing, economic development, etc. Uh, so Judy's been very good in terms of preparing PowerPoint presentations, asking the really hard questions and soliciting and engaging the responses of the citizens that attend the meetings. And you know, I've been to a few of those meetings and I've been really impressed with them. And not only, of course, impressed with Judy herself and her uh, an immense ability at facilitating these things, but also impressed with the community because all of a sudden when you ask people, everybody's got something to say. And while that might sound fractious, it's really not yeah. because sometimes, of course, there are differing opinions, but it really brings people together and talking about them. About it really issues. does, and I saw that specifically at the last planning, sorry, uh, master plan meeting last week. Um, Judy's format was a little bit different this time. It was an interactive um, format, and just to preface it, you know, I, I I was really happy to see thirty some faces in the crowd. Fantastic! It really was, and a lot of them were there. Uh, you know, other than being some long term residents, but some new people as well that mm -hmm. just moved in are mm -hmm. really excited. Mm -hmm. So this master plan uh, process has a way of actually pulling the community together as a whole, so they can have a common vision. So Judy was able to ask, you know, things that you like and don't like, um, and then she got the people to actually prioritize. Um, the things that they want to see happen in the town in terms of policies and goal settings. So it was really interactive and had a tremendous amount of um, enthusiasm from the crowd. Um, they were chatting among themselves and it was collaborative. It was really and I think you've raised so many points here because one of my questions to you was going to be what is the purpose of a town plan? And of course I know the master plan when you're applying for grants and that sort of thing it's part of that process so there is that administrative yeah. purpose for a master plan but on a much more fundamental level that really involves the town's residents this is how you want to see your town and i know one of the questions that judy i've heard her ask repeatedly is what do you want to see sterling be exactly. 10 years from now 20 years from now exactly so that's how, how often should a, a town plan be renewed? So there's different ways to do it. There can be complete rate rewrites, maybe 15, 20 years. Uh, but you know, you can actually maybe even five years to 10 years out do uh, chapter updates. You know, because the master plan is a living document. Sure. Um, it represents. It's organic. It really, really is. Mm -hmm. It represents a moment in time where these were the priorities and um, you know the the goals and policies and starting the implementation. But sometimes, you know, with time and, and going through the implementation, you, you see that perhaps some things needed to be tweaked. Um, some things are perhaps, you know, unforeseen. So that's when, you know, you would do these updates. Now, so we talked about, you know, we've got Judy Barrett, we've got the community. What about in so far as town uh, boards and committees, yeah. who kind of owns the plan, uh, the master plan in, in, in that way? Who is it that, that needs to drive from the town? So that's a really great question. The state statute actually says that the planning board shall prepare a master plan. And those are, that's literally the words from the state statute. It is a product that's owned by the planning board and should be driven by the planning board. Um, and at this point, we're awaiting an official um, organization and appointment of the actual master plan committee that this is a group that can actually start to deliberate and, and move things forward officially. So we are awaiting that action. And once this all gets, gets going, how long a process is this? I mean, are we looking at months? Are we looking at years? Are, are you referring to... To the master plan. To the completion of that it? That is correct. So, for example, if this was... 
um, a product that was actually created by a planning consultant um, and that was their sole job. That process would probably take a year, year and a half. Um, in the case where we're kind of doing it a little bit piecemeal in terms of, you know, in terms of uh, trying to acquire grant fundings and things of that nature, it's going to be a little bit of a longer process. I, I see it probably on the scope of two to three years. Right. Yeah. yeah. Now, how can people get involved? Because, um, as you say, there's, there's meetings. When are these meetings? How can people find out about them? How can the townspeople become involved? That's a great question. Um, we actually have on the town's website a master plan um, page. When you click on it, on the upper left-hand corner, there's actually a, a tab that says, you know, register to be a um, master plan committee member. So when they register for it, or have the different topic elements, as I mentioned earlier, like land use, economic development, so forth, and people can actually choose multiple um, topics that they want to be involved in. So this way we actually have almost like a repository of um, names, contact information, and the topics of their interest. So that way we're able to pull groups together and have like master plan, uh, master emailing list sure. to let them know, hey, we're having a meeting on this, please show up. Um, and also our upcoming open house on Thursday, April 4, uh, which is a drop-in session between 4 and 8. So anyone in the community is um, encouraged to attend and even uh, business owners, business owners that perhaps don't live in the community but still have a vest vested interest, especially in economic uh, development. Now the open house, I did want to speak to you about that, so where is that happening? Is that here at the Butterick? No, that's going to be happening at the Sterling Senior Center on Senior Monday. Center. Road. Yeah, okay. it's it's handicapped accessible. Uh, we're going to have some refreshments. We're going to hopefully have some kind of babysitting. We really want to engage as many people as possible, young, old, and even middle schoolers, children, because they're going to be the most impacted by what comes out of this plan. Sure. Now, what can you see over the next few years? are going to be real priorities for, for, for Sterling. Um, what can people expect? Um, I think a lot of it is to keep up the momentum and interest in the master plan and to, for, to, to see it through to its fruition where all the chapters are written and the actual plan is adopted by the planning board. Um, and from there, um, the master plan will have in it like short, me, uh, mid and long term goals and objectives um, you know, priorities, things that need to be changed. So to have like perhaps at that point a master plan implementation committee mm -hmm. where we habitually meet and prioritize which action items we would like to take further and prioritize them by year. Now, with the master plan committee, uh, and maybe you don't know the answer to this, is this going to be an appointed committee? Is it going to be an elected committee? Um, how is that going to work? There's a couple of different ways in which this can evolve. Um, Ideally, it would be, it is the purview of the planning board, um, so it would be wonderful if they were, um, they, they appointed them. But for example, for each chapter element, like for example, let's just take housing. Um, so perhaps the people that uh, signed up on the webpage for the interest in housing, perhaps those people can even meet together and from them choose a select person, sorry, not a select person, a chairperson. And that um, chairperson would be the actual voting member of the master plan committee but would report back to their working group. Sure. So I don't want to put any limits on the working groups mm -hmm. per, mm -hmm. per chapter on who can join. Any, anyone is welcome but we do need to have one central kind of lead per chapter topic. That sounds like a huge challenge as uh, the both the incoming and the new town planner and the First town planner, it just sounds like there's a lot. You enjoying it? I am enjoying it, and I, I find that the best part of my day is actually meeting the really wonderful people in Sterling. Um, I've already made some really wonderful friendships, and there's a really lot of like incredible people out there, and I'm happy to help them. And I know that people are enjoying meeting you as oh, well, thank and you. Again, finding you very helpful with this process. Thank you so much for speaking with me. I know I'll be talking to you about this again, and uh, thank you. Thank you. I'm now in Lancaster with Michael Antonellis. He is the town planner for Lancaster. Welcome, Michael. Thanks. Thanks for having me. And uh, now you are also very new to your job. Is that not so? You started in January. That's correct. So I'm uh, now entering my second month on you're the job with the town of Lancaster. Month. That's right. So you're all ready to talk about everything that's going to affect 
Lancaster for super the next, prepared, yes. super prepared for the next few decades. Yeah. Uh, now, in terms of getting yourself ramped up, what's involved with that? What have you had to look at, and what are the documents that you're looking at, and that what are you working on, basically? So, just in general, yeah. the job of yeah. the director of planning at Lancaster. Sure. Um, well, my primary job really is to serve as staff to the Planning Board and the Board of Appeals, uh, otherwise known as the Zoning Board of Appeals in other towns. Uh, you'll hear it refer referred to as the ZBA. Um, so I am technical staff to the Planning Board, and that means everything from you know setting up meetings, being in contact with applicants, receiving applications, making sure that the Board has the applications ahead of time so that everybody's prepared for a meeting. Um, so that's the technical aspect. Uh, I'm also a service professional staff to the planning board. So uh, what that involves is if the planning board uh, wants staff to look into something, you know, more uh, to uh, refine a bylaw. Let's say, for instance, we just had a conversation about uh, our water resource district. So what the planning board would want uh, in this case is for me to look at other towns, bylaws, and water resource districts to see what they're doing in comparison to what uh, Lancaster is doing. Mm -hmm. And then also comparing that to what the state requirements are in 310 CMR <laughs> mm -hmm. for, for the state. So, um, so that's, that's a sort of a broad perspective of what I do sure. uh, with some specific examples. Uh, but it's also interfacing with the public. Um, you know, our office receives applications, uh, proposals for development. So interfacing with uh, developers as well as residents. Um, many times you have residents themselves apply to the boards, uh, specifically the Board of Appeals for a variance is, is often the case. Uh, you know, they want to put in a garage and it's a little too close to the property line. They would need a variance from the Board of Appeals. Um, also, the Board of Appeals, uh, they, uh, a large part of what they do is here, the comprehensive permits. So the affordable housing chapter 40B. So the, uh, as, you know, those, are, those are pretty sure. pretty important in, in the towns that they, they have. In. Now, when you're talking about applications, so um, you're talking about housing projects and residential things. Is that also business permits that you receive, business applications? For sure, yeah. It's everything. It's, it's quite the range. So it's everything from, like I said, it could be a garage. It could be a shed that requires a variance from the Board of Appeals. It could be a business that is uh, requesting perhaps a parking variance right. uh, for a reduction in the amount of parking spaces that they feel is not necessary, but is in conflict with what our bylaws dictate that, you know, you need three spaces per 300 square feet of office space or something like that. Uh, they may feel that they don't need that, so they would apply for a variance. But it's also uh, in Lancaster, we have what is called the Integrated Planning Overlay District. Mm -hmm. And that is a portion of the town in the northwesterly corner of Lancaster that is intended to provide some design flexibility to entice businesses to come in and uh, work with the town, uh, provide a, a certain portion of it as residential, as well as mixing in uh, the business components and, and things like that. So that's, that's a part of our bylaw. Uh, that is targeted towards development uh, in Lancaster. So it's it's uh, it's not only uh, to recap uh, dealing with residents, helping them navigate the per permitting process through the boards, but also being in contact with the developers, uh, business owners who are, who are already in the town um, to help them also navigate uh, the permitting process through town. It's a very detail oriented type of function it sounds like to me. I mean you're talking on the one hand you're talking about you know when you're talking about variances yes. and measurements and that sort of thing but you're also talking about aesthetics you're talking about what people want so it's really a broad range of of of, uh, of aspects. Absolutely I mean you're we get down to very specific details uh, say when when I'm doing a review of a plan everything from you know sidewalk width uh, to you just uh, uh, the general layout of let's say lots in a subdivision so okay. you're looking for all the components if it's a if it's a subdivision you're looking for integration with existing uh, characteristics such as wetlands and how it interfaces with that and as well as the the safety components of you know not having too wide a turning radius or sure. like I said the width of sidewalks things like that that actually impact uh, your day-to-day -day and your enjoyments of 
your home sure. if you were to move there. And your community, of course. Yeah. Um, let's talk about Lancaster's town plan. Sure. Uh, the master plan, how old is it, Where? Uh, what? what's happening with that, how involved are you with that? Yeah, so uh, the last master plan is from 2007, so Lancaster is pretty fortunate to have a fairly updated uh, master plan, I'd say. Um, we are not currently in the process of updating that master plan, um, but I, I have to imagine that that would be, that's in the future, uh, I'd say the near future, probably within Within the next five years, we'll probably start looking at uh, updating that or uh, creating a brand new one, whichever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, what are the things that are really kind of top of the list now for Lancaster in terms of things that are in the master plan or things that you're working on? What can residents expect to see in terms of issues that are coming up or yeah. changes that they're going to see? Yeah, I think the biggest change going forward is just the general build out of the town i mean lancaster has a lot of land uh, currently uh, one of the first things i noticed when i uh, took the position here in lancaster is uh, the vast hay fields that exist in the town uh, i was really impressed uh, as i drove through town these rolling hills of of undisturbed uh, hay field it, it was kind of amazing but uh, what that presents is that uh, there is land that is in Lancaster that is undisturbed. Uh, being, uh, I wouldn't necessarily call us a suburb of Boston, but we are out on probably the exurban uh, mm -hmm. side of things, uh, being this far west of Boston and, you know, just a little bit north of Worcester. Um, there's, there is going to be a demand to construct homes, to build out, and so I imagine the biggest uh, issue going forward uh, that will be on a lot of people's mind for when, whenever we decide to take the challenge of producing a master plan is housing. Mm -hmm. uh, what, is, what is our housing going to look like? Because that is really the, not only providing for housing for people who already are in Lancaster or people who want to be in Lancaster, but what does that housing look like? How do we want it to interface with the town? How do we want it to connect and feel uh, in the future, you know, 10, 20, 30 years down the line when we see waves of, uh, you know, population and movements throughout the state? What is your sense of how people feel about that sort of growth? And, and my reason for that question is, as uh, the editor of the newspaper in Sterling, one of the things that I, I here all the time is the two sides of uh, these opinions on the growth process. I have people that say to me, gosh, you know, we miss the great old days when the population of Sterling was mm. 2,000 people sure. and we really don't want to see that change. And other people are saying, oh, we love it just the way it is. And then others are saying, you know, but we need to grow, we need yeah. to have uh, we need to develop the downtown and and yeah. whatnot. So I'm hearing all of those sorts of things all the time. What are what is what is the intelligence that you're getting from the community? Um, well, there are there's certainly like as you said, there's two sides of the story. There are people who would like to maintain the town as is, and there are people who want to see the town grow. Um, I mean those those two viewpoints aren't necessarily in total conflict. Mm -hmm. um, I view it as the job of the planning board, as well as my position and other town officials to uh, bring that together, um, because really that's important. What, you, what you're talking about is an important component of planning, which is maintaining uh, the characteristics of a town that makes a town special, uh, and uh, but also juggling development with that. And that's why a master plan is so important, is be it looks at what your demographics look like today uh, with the understanding of uh, that's going to change uh, as people continue to have children, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, the population grows. And even as I mentioned, there's a uh, population moves. Um, right. So people will likely continue to move further and further west. Um, and so you're confronted with the issue of how do we maintain our town? Mm -hmm. We love our town. We love what it offers. What we need to do is list, uh, uh, literally list what uh, it is that we love about the town. What are the characteristics that we want to keep? Um, and going forward, putting goals in and uh, 
actionable items in order to achieve those goals while balancing you know, any shift in population or demand for development. And, you know, I think this is so important because, as you say, there's this shift, people moving out into, you know, west of, mm -hmm. of 495 and whatnot. And, of course, there's a lot of reasons for that. There's, you know, the housing costs and whatnot. Yes. But there's also that people, even if they work in a more urban setting, they love the feel Absolutely. of places like Lancaster yeah. and everything that that uh, that, that, that entails. Yeah. So is that a huge challenge from a planning perspective to maintain those things while still planning on growth? I mean, how does one even do that? Yeah, no, that, that goes back to what we were just talking about, uh, maintaining those characteristics of what those particular people uh, probably love about the town. Uh, again, it would be through the uh, master planning process to hopefully identify that. Um, and then directing development. So uh, without speaking on behalf of Lancaster, uh, generally uh, what you would do is you would focus your development to nodes of the town. Uh, that is typically in association with major routes that are cutting through town. Um, so you, you may have a downtown, uh, take, take Mansfield, for example, Mansfield has a train. They have the T coming through right, right through their downtown. They have, uh, routes 140 and 106, uh, and then their downtown is right in the middle of all of that pretty much. And so that's where they've focused development to grow vertically. So that's a plan. That's, uh, what we would call smart growth, uh, where it, it integrates both residential and business, as well as it uh, relies upon transportation. Uh, obviously, you have uh, the train right there and uh, connecting bus routes that, that uh, service the train. Um, so that's, that's a planning uh, process perspective that would direct uh, your development to the nodes of, of mm -hmm. your town. Mm -hmm. uh, again, without spe uh, speaking specifically towards Lancaster, again, we, uh, they would need to embark on the sure. master planning process to identify where they would want to focus the development. Now, can you project what population growth is going to be? What, what has population growth in, in Lancaster been like, say, over the past decade? And can you project what's going to happen? Yeah, I don't have the numbers in front of me, so I can't sure. speak specifically about the numbers, but it's, it's steadily grown, I'd say, since um, the 60s. Uh, ooh, I think... And again, don't quote me on this. Sure. Well, it's on, it's filmed, right. so you'll quote me on it. But uh, back in the 50s and 60s, um, you know, it was a much lower population. Obviously, it was probably less than half the population. Now, to, today, the population is approximately 8,000 people. Um, based on the last census, obviously, it's 2019. Tw the 2020 census will be coming out, and we'll have a much better idea of where the town is currently mm -hmm. as far as demographics as far as population, as far as uh, just number of housing units, things like that. Um, so it's been a steady increase over the past several decades. Um, you know, I think they've jumped uh, maybe almost 2,000 mm -hmm. uh, in a particular decade, and then it continues to kind of creep up. So they were probably around a little over 2,000 people you know, prior to the 50s, mm -hmm. and now we're at about 8,000, so. Now, those population changes as well, that obviously also affects infrastructure, the schools, the, the resources, the infrastructure oh, yeah. of a town, and is that something as a planner that you're involved with as well, you look at those things? The infrastructure, uh, absolutely. Um, the schools, not so much. The school board is separate from uh, town offices essentially mm -hmm. um, so uh, I couldn't speak to the, the, sure. the school side um, but infrastructure for sure uh, Lancaster is currently working with Mass DOT on a on their uh, complete streets uh, grant program mm -hmm. um, and so there are, there are smaller things that are happening around town uh, you know things like improvements of sidewalks uh, but those are all things that deteriorate deteriorate over time sure. uh, and with use um, so increased population definitely affects that so you have to uh, be aware of that going forward uh, I mean they're also looking at a uh, re 
a redesign of the Route 70 and 117. 70, right. Yeah, again, uh, if I'm wrong, correct me. This is my no, second month yeah. on the job. <laughs> I was trying to remember all the routes. Yeah. But yeah, up in North Lancaster. Um, so those are improvements that are being made to, main, to uh, help alleviate a uh, traffic problem up there, uh, as I've heard from several residents. Uh, sure. And experience for myself uh, taking a right or a left when you're heading north on uh, Main Street as you intersect mm -hmm. um, with mm -hmm. that major route uh, can be a bit uh, can be a bit uh, troubling. Um, right. So so that's that's a problem that will only increase with population. Mm -hmm. So uh, t taking the steps now to look at that and correct that issue. Now you talked about complete streets, and that's a that's a, a term that we hear quite a bit. What yes. what is complete streets, and what is that? Entail. Complete streets, yeah, you should definitely talk to uh, somebody from MassDOT would give you a, a very comprehensive look of what complete streets uh, are and what they look like in Massachusetts. I mean, a complete street is probably up for debate, but it, it, when you think of a street, you have the, the road itself, the paved portion of the road, but then you have the right-of-way, which extends beyond that. Uh, which typically includes uh, sidewalks. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So you have the street portion, then you may have sidewalks, and then you may, it may extend, depending on the road, mm -hmm. beyond that sum. Uh, what you look for with complete streets is providing for uh, multimodal transit mm -hmm. transportation, which includes cars, it includes pedestrians, it includes bikes. bikes right. um, so so uh, looking to improve roads and streets in a town to provide for all of those uses um, and uh, if you can uh, do that in a, in a way that is also aesthetically pleasing uh, involving uh, street trees and things of that made uh, that nature um, and there's all sorts of different elements that can be combined into that but that's just a broad overview right. of what complete streets would entail. Lots and lots of different aspects to your job, and uh, it sounds like uh, you're going to be very, very busy over the next few years. Absolutely. With planning in Lancaster. Congratulations on your appointment, and thank you so much for speaking with me, Michael. Thanks I look so much, forward to talking with you again. All right.